Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. to chase Tom and Dan away. I've done all right up till now. It's the light of day. I need to get rid of these fuckers. And when my agent calls, I'm going solo. A chud and a chud. Chud a chud and a chud and a chud. I'm not doing it. I'm not thinking about my feelings. This is stupid. You guys are stupid. Seriously, this is the last time I let you guys write anything without my direct supervision. You guys seriously can't do things while I'm on vacation. I trusted you. I told you to get this done. And this is what you come up with. I hate all of this. Just another wasted Thursday. Wish these forms would go away. Cause this is my payday. They don't have to come today. Gross. For the manic my first day. Chuddy chud chud, you're not just a bucket. Chuddy chud chud, chud the talking bucket. I don't understand. This is just bad. This is really bad. I was told there'd be no singing. Life is a oh mystery. Oh, Everyone Check. must Check. stand alone. I hear I'll you call, call you. my name, and it feels like Chad, Chad, you Chad, call Chad, my Chad, name. Chad, it's like Chad, a little Chad, prayer. Chad, I'm Chad, guys, what the hell are you doing? We're, we're supposed to go live tomorrow. This is costing us money. Can we please just record the opening song now? I guess this kind of got caught up in the whole <sighs> yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Oh, God damn it, that's not what... Masters of the Universe Super Saturday Super Power Hour! Tune into the Fire Pit Podcast on the last Saturday of the month and join Dan, Tom, and Josh as they watch movies based on some of the greatest 80s Saturday morning cartoons ever! Yo Joe with G.I. Joe Retaliation! Yo Joe! Transform and roll out with the Transformers! Transform and roll out! Jam out with Jam and the Holograms. Then take on Skeletor with Masters of the Universe. It's Marshmallow Cereal and all your childhood memories. And it's only at the Fire Pit. Who needs school when weekends rule? Good evening. 
Wait, wait, no. Good morning, bots and listeners. Welcome back to the fire pit. I'm Josh, rock star name Ace Reg. <laughs> and we're getting totally rad here on the fire pit. I'm on the keytar, rocking our way to the Masters of the Universe Super Saturday Super Power Hour. We rolled out with the Transformers and yoed with the Joes, and we're working our way towards Masters of the Universe. We have one more jam session to get through before then, though. So now, to tell you more about what we're watching, I'll solo over to Dan. Thank you, Josh. Dan here. Rock star named Dashing Nigel. Uh, As mentioned before, we've already watched G.I. Joe Retaliation in 2007's Transformers. So we had two flawed, albeit fun, movies. But not a whole lot of fun is probably going to be had tonight with this one. No offense, ladies, because tonight we're watching Gem and the Holograms, the 2015 coming of age story that is quote unquote based. Based. Yeah, based. Based on the campy villain of the week musical show about a woman that can hollow project herself as a different persona using advanced AI. None of that is in this film. No fun is going to be had. And to tell us what we might be in for a pretty rough night or morning, uh, I'll use my drums. And I'll play on over to Tom. Thank you, Dan. Tom here. Rock star name Tom Two Tones Two Pete. <laughs> and yes, tonight we'll be watching and trying to survive something outrageous. Something truly, truly, truly outrageous. 2015's Gem and the Holograms, starring Aubrey Peoples, Stephanie Scott. Molly Ringwald, Aurora Perino, and Juliet Lewis. Hey, I got it all in one take! All right! This movie was released on October 23rd in 2015. It has a 22% critic score and a 40% audience score on Rotten Tomato, with an IMDb of 4 out of 10, making this quite possibly the lowest rated movie we've watched on this journey and possibly one of the lowest rated movies we've seen on this podcast since Slipstream. No, no, no. Slipstream was actually pretty popular, was actually had a fairly high rating. I think Pathfinder was the worst. Yeah, it was Pathfinder and uh, Swashbuckler were... No, Swashbuckler had like a 60. Really? Let's see. Yeah. I'm, pulling up, yeah. I'm pulling up Pathfinder right now. It has a... F- 5.4 percent really we had a movie that was significant oh no what was it that one movie with wesley snipes art of war oh yeah yeah Shoot, i forgot we even watched that movie i think most people forgot that they watched yeah. that movie that's still a 5.7 sorry i'm totally bogarting this, this is in the top five of the lowest rated films we've ever watched on this whole entire show yes And also one of the lowest budgeted, too. This movie has a budget of $5 million and a global box office of... Nigel, drumroll, please. (laughs) 2.3 million dollars. Sad Sad. Price is Right music. Oh, but um, but um, wow. (laughs) (laughs) That is... That is, I wonder how much of that 2.3 million is people who accidentally bought the wrong ticket online. (laughs) But that leads me into some production notes about this movie. So who wants some production? Well, at $5 million budget, it can't be that much of a production. Like, I think there's fan-made YouTube movies that have to have a bigger budget than that. Oh, yeah. No, I was looking at some YouTube stuff while you know, researching this movie. And there's some like fan made gem in the hologram music videos that beat the trailer for this movie hands down, but I'm getting a bit of a head of myself on this. So gem in the holograms tagline, every generation needs a voice summary. Small town girl, Jerrica lives an unexceptional life until she takes on a secret identity inspired by her music becoming Jem, the bold, stunning, and absolutely fearless singer that catapults from an underground video sensation to global superstar. But it seems that she may lose touch with the things that really matter the most, and Jerrica and her band of three sisters begin a one in a million journey, discovering that some talents are too special to keep hidden. Now, 
Dan, I know that you don't have sisters. Uh, Josh, did you have any sisters at all growing up? Uh, not really, no. I had, like, my cousin as kind of a sister, but she moved out when I was, like, really young, so I don't have a lot of experience or a lot of memories of that. So you pretty much know I never grew- was raised with a uh, sister. Okay, but you you both were very aware of Gem and the Holograms growing up, at least. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I'm yeah. definitely aware of it, because just like the lineup for this uh, journey, like, it was always sandwiched in between Transformers and G.I. Joe or Transformers and He-Man or something like that. It was in that same lineup. It was always in the same lineup of the after school slash Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So wh- how would you guys summarize the cartoon Gem and the Holograms? Just what you know through um, osmosis. Best thing I could say is my experience with it is I don't think I've ever watched a complete episode because Jim and the holograms ran from, was it 85 to 89? Yeah. So I was, I myself was born in 83. So it was caught up towards the tail end of me being ready for Saturday morning cartoons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I just remember that it was starring a girl. I wasn't really that into it. Who am I kidding? I love Jim and the holograms. I had all the action figures (laughs) to the surprise of no one on this podcast. (laughs) <laughs> yeah shock of shocks <laughs> but all honesty no i didn't have i don't have a lot of experience with it i'm not familiar with it so yeah. um tom i know you shared a few of those music videos in our uh chat and i was just like i know the theme song but i don't think i've seen a full episode all the way through or if i have i have long since forgotten about it <laughs> yeah i remember the theme song i remember the theme song and um i don't remember much of the show i actually had to watch a couple of the episodes that you put on youtube to kind of remember it a little bit Mm because obviously I wasn't in the right demographic for the show, obviously. So I don't have a whole lot of nostalgia for it the way I have nostalgia for Transformers, G.I. Joe, Mm -hmm. Mm He-Man, Ninja Turtles, all those shows from the 80s and 90s. I remember the basics of the show was like she has these earrings that create a holographic projection of herself, but she's like a different character when she's singing. Like she's Jim Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. her her name is Jerrica when she's not Jim. So it had like a Clark Kent slash He-Man kind of vibe. Like Prince Adam turns into He-Man, Clark Kent turns into Superman, while Jerrica turns into Jim. Uh, but unlike He-Man and, and Superman, Jim's not really a superhero. Mm-hmm. Jim's just a music performer. But, but like, it was more like a um, villain of the week or situation of the week kind of show. Like, mm-hmm. and most, and most episodes revolve around her trying to hide her identity from those closest to her. And balance being both Jim and Jerrica and like who is the real person is mm-hmm. it Jerrica or is it Jim that's kind of what I remember of it but I don't remember like a specific episodes or I don't remember specific lines from the show except for the truly truly outrageous line because that's in the theme song yeah yeah but product of the 80s very much so you would say mm. lots of MTV generation music videos and everything oh yeah very yeah yeah and she almost looked like uh she belonged on like the bangles or um Maybe Cindy Lauper or something like that. Like she dressed very like heavy makeup with the the frayed out hair and mm-hmm. different colored hair and all that stuff. So yeah, peak of style, peak of fashion, peak of mm-hmm. you know pop culture relevance and such. Wild, lavish set pieces, costume designs, a high production value in that universe. You would think that they want that with their movie, wouldn't you? For an eighties nostalgia product like this you'd think they'd go yeah let's just go gaudy with this let's go high budget with this movie you would think they would do that right you yeah think they did not they cheaped out left and right on this they chose people that had no reason to make this show into a movie who had <laughs> no experience making music videos or anything like that actually i take that back the director John Chu did have some experience doing some wilder stuff. He did Justin Bieber's Believe and G.I. Joe Retaliation. But the cast, they got people you've never heard of. I think almost all of them, Aubrey, Haley, Stephanie, they were all just TV actors and actresses. None of them had any real music experience before this series. Although I do have some trivia about what some of these girls have done after the movie that kind of mirror their characters they played in this movie but the only real name that they got for this movie was molly ringwald because it's an 80s product so of course you have to have an 80s actress 
Um, and yeah, I would say Juliet. I would say Juliet Lewis is a pretty well known actress too. Like she's in this movie, so yeah, she's also yes. But it's not like any of the people that play Jem in the holograms you would pick out. It's not like um, mm-hmm. Josie and the Pussycats, which we saw years ago. We knew the actresses in Josie and the Pussycats. Oh yeah, these are all like no names. Yeah, like, we, like you read their names, like who the fuck is this? Yeah, have I? Dude, even even the Wikipedia page about this movie says. Very loosely based on Christy Marx's 1980s animated television series, Jim. Oh, so loosely. And the guy they got to do the music for the film, uh, Nathan Lanier. Um, no, no. He's done Dancing with the Stars and the score to Halo 4, Forward Unto Dawn. Oh, so he also did some So You Think You Can Dance. That's it. That's who they got for this. That's... Why? It's like they yeah. didn't even try. It's like no one cared. Okay, you still have to save something for expectations here, Tom. I know, yeah. I know. I'm <laughs> jumping way ahead of myself. And maybe maybe when we see this, uh we'll be um it'll maybe I see these actresses do their stuff. I mean, maybe some of these girls have something going on. Maybe the actors and actresses, but yeah, yeah, the production is there really was no production for this movie. It was an obligation for the studio, and it it just looks like it. So, Nigel, what's some trivia here? Why do you have any insight why they were so? I, I have, I've got a pretty good trivia story about this, but I don't know if it steps on Josh's toe. So, actually, for the first time ever, Josh, I want you to give some box office numbers before I do the trivia. I know it's supposed to be my turn, but I don't want to like reveal this story unless you've already got it. Yeah, well, I've got um, other stuff. I've got other you. stuff too, but I don't want to just say, "Oh, yeah, well, it only made this much money, and because it only made this much money, this happened." So you go first, and then I'll chime in with the. Yeah, because uh, this section is going to be quick story. tonight because <laughs> it made this about a movie. And a half. <laughs> okay, the oh my god, this movie. Okay, so it's like we mentioned gross domestic total of two point one million dollars. I'm going to, you know, just to pad my section a little bit, $2,184,640. That's how much money this movie made domestically. Yeah. Guess how much it made internationally. I'm not even going to give you a second. $149,044 for a brand total of $2,333,684. It ran for two weeks. Jesus God. Yeah. That, that's yeah that's what i had was fucking hell so where do you think it placed on its opening weekend i'm gonna Thank cut you. you off and just go ahead and tell you 15th <laughs> holy shit <laughs> there was only 15 movies out that weekend <laughs> but all honesty what do you guys think was the number one movie that weekend uh what, what, what when did it come out again I'll, I'll give you a hint it was october 23rd 2015 the movie was the number one movie was on its fourth week of release it was a uh i don't even want to tell you who the director was what what movie do you think it was nigel Hmm. number one movie october 2015 yes sir uh i'm trying to think um i'm blanking now didn't any movies come out in 2015 uh, jesus uh shit October 2015, uh, was it a Marvel film? No, no, it wasn't. But it was based off of a fairly famous book that came out within oh, the past. Oh, oh, um, oh. Uh, Jurassic, uh, one of the Jurassic Parks, the, 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 the reboots, soft reboots, Jurassic World 1, or like the first Jurassic World, like the first one with, with Chris, uh, what's his name? Star-Lord? All right, uh, Tom- Thompson, what do you think? I'm guessing Ender's Game. I'm probably wrong. I think that was 2008 now that I'm thinking about, but I'm going to go Ender's Game. Well, Jurassic World was actually number 28 for that weekend, and oh. it was on its 20th week of release. Okay, okay. I know it came out in 2015, but I, could, I thought it was, okay. Well, so. it's a very lonely movie that was up at the top. Ridley Scott's The Martian starring Matt Damon. Oh, oh, I completely forgot about that movie. Oh. It made three times the budget of Gem and the Holograms at $15 million that weekend alone. Jesus. But at number one was The Martian. 
making, like I said, 15 million. Number two was Goosebumps making 15.5 million, just $200,000 less. Keep that in mind, $200,000 less than The Martian. And then Bridge of Spies at number three, making 11 million. The Last Witch Hunter, everybody remembers that Vin Diesel movie, right? Making $10 million. And number five, Hotel Transylvania 2, making more money than the entire run of Gem and the Holograms at $8.8 million. Not just more money, but like four times the amount that Gem and the Holograms Jesus made. Fucking oh hell. But other movies that actually was released that we- weekend was Rock the Casbah. I don't even remember that movie. And Paranormal Activity, The Ghost Dimension, which made like four times the amount of money <laughs> that Jim and the Holograms made its entire run. <laughs> oh my God, this is a travesty. Yes. So guess how much Jim and the Holograms made on its second week of release? I actually know the exact number, so I'll just let Tom guess. Um, $50. <laughs> Almost. Oh, Jesus. 387000 it dropped from 15th to a remarkable 18. Like it was down 71% from its first weekend, which tells you it's a terrible movie because the three of us have done enough research on box office numbers that an average drop from week one to week two is typically 40 to 50%. Mm-hmm. And that's if the film's bad. That No, that's if the film's not even bad. That's like an average drop. If the film's bad, it's about a 60% drop. But yeah. if it's really bad, it's a 71%. 0.8% drop. Dude, I was doing a little bit of like spot checking here. I honestly, Nigel, I think you're right. I think this is the worst IMDb rate rated movie we have seen. I didn't go against the Rotten Tomato score, but in terms of IMDb, every movie that we've seen has been at least in the sixes. I think one of them was in the high fives. This is a 4.4. Yeah, even even other movies that we've watched that aren't like proto episodes, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 is like a six on IMDb. Like other like quote unquote bad films we've watched, you know, so no, like even our proto film, you said Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. That's actually episode one. But our proto film Showdown in Little Tokyo is a 6.1. Yeah. So Showdown in Little Tokyo ranks higher than this. Yes. Significantly. Oh, God. God, this is blood on the highway here. Dude, Guyver 2 has a (laughs) 5.8. Guyver 2 has a 5.8 and this movie has oh my god oh my oh god lord but yeah so like i think i've successfully filled in like a gas which i think this movie is going to be um my section <laughs> combustible <laughs> so nigel thank you very much for letting me go first because I feel like there's going to be uh, the the Venn diagram of the two of us. The box office is the <laughs> massive a trivia. It's a circle. <laughs> yeah, like it's a circle. Because, <laughs> well, the biggest the biggest bit of trivia I did have was the box office was the uh, the huge drop off. One of the worst drop offs ever. Um, going from one point three eight. Uh, in its North American opening to 387,000 the following week. It was so bad the following week that Universal actually pulled the film from wide release and actually stopped reporting box office figures. Um, <laughs> they just it's pulled one the, of the plug. It's, like, it's one of the shortest ever for a major studio film. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't say that uh, I'm going to interject just a slight because I missed this. It was released in 2,400 theaters. So this was a this was a wide release. It was yeah, a wide yeah. release. Christ. Yeah. So that's several theaters in almost every major city in the in America. So yeah, it's like it's not it's not one of the worst box office bombs of all time because only getting two and a half million on a five million dollar budget isn't that's that's only getting half your money back. That's not a huge box office bomb. That's not like more recently like the Marvels was a bigger bomb because it cost more money to make. Um, like if it had cost $50 million and only made two and a half million, then it would be a huge bomb. Mm-hmm. But it's, I mean, it's still a disappointing run, but uh, yeah. So that was the biggest bit of trivia I had was about the uh, box office or lack thereof. Another uh, bit of trivia I did have for it was Christy Marks, the creator of gem said she had no idea the film was going to be made and was upset that Hasbro never even informed her or consulted her about it. <laughs> The shade. Yeah. She was eventually given a cameo role 
um, as the Rolling Stone editor that shows up in the movie, but that was actually during reshoots, and uh, that was only after some fan backlash. Uh, it's kind of weird that this movie did so bad and had such a bad production because it was actually made at the height of the Saturday morning cartoon movies, actually doing pretty well at the box office. Uh, by this point, three Transformers movies had been out, so there was a market for car- Saturday morning cartoons being made into major production movies. Now, I get it that Jem doesn't need the same budget as, say, Optimus Prime, but it kind of feels like that this was only written to, uh, well, like Tom said, it kind of almost feels like a um, Roger Corman Fantastic Four kind of situation where they just made the film because they're afraid to lose the license. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. the damn thing ran for three seasons. Yeah. And it was pretty popular. Like I said, I don't have the nostalgia for it because I wasn't in the right demographic for it, but I do have cousins that watch this and they have nostalgia for it. So like there's a market here. So, yeah. you know, at least there was. So to put it in perspective, uh, Gem and the Holograms is a Hasbro rated or a Hasbro owned property. And the Transformers and the G.I. Joes are also Hasbro properties. Transformers, the original 2007 movie, was given a budget of $150 million. G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra was given $175 million. Even Battleship, of all things, had a $220 million budget. Jesus. Uh, the one adaptation based on a girl-oriented franchise, five million bucks. Say that one more time. No, no, seriously, five million bucks. Yeah, 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 yeah. And to add insult to injury, or salt on a on a wound, the budget for the Barbie movie, which clearly Hasbro cared about, had a hundred and forty-five million dollars to it. Well, that's because Hasbro doesn't own Barbie. Mattel does. So oh, well, never well. Strike that, reverse it. Tom, edit in that you said the right company right there. <laughs> the budget for the Barbie movie, which clearly Mattel cared about, had $145 million to it. <laughs> yeah, so no, Mattel owns Barbie, not uh, not Hasbro. But still, um, M- yeah. Mattel cared enough about Barbie to put money into their product yeah. and making that so, it's Oh, yeah, I'm like, seriously... Like, this movie is going to be a train wreck. It's it's really going to be an absolute dumpster fire. I just I don't have any faith in it. Um, yeah, seriously. Before we get into expectations, the uh, last little bit of trivia I do have: uh, the movie was originally written to more resemble the television show, uh, but producers were like, "No one's going to buy this," so they ordered uh, rewrites to the script and they changed it from what it was to a coming of age kind of story, which hmm. is dumb. Yeah. So yeah, so we had this. This kind of leads into past discussions in, with GI Joe and Transformers, like respecting the source material. Right. Mm-hmm. Like when we did Transformers a, a few weeks ago, I talked about in the trivia section. I talked about just how much of a disaster that movie could have been. Oh yeah. Because of what the producers originally wanted to do, there were so many other ideas talked about. Like the Transformers weren't supposed to talk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, another writing idea for the Transformers was they were going to be mechs. Like oh, they, people would they write in, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's when you get that's when you get the board involved, and then they just want to start doing weird shit. Like at one point, I remember one of the Batman scripts thrown around was Batman was homeless and Alfred was like a big burly black guy who was going to help him on the streets. They're like, they're, make a different film that doesn't even sound yeah, like Batman. Just make not. a different film. Yeah. So. Before we get into expectations, I just wanted to throw one thing out here. Your guys' favorite film, Josie and the Pussycats, <laughs> came out 14 years earlier. Yes. Had a budget of $40 million and made $14.9 million worldwide. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. It still made more than this movie, though. Significantly more. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, but wow. Yeah. I didn't know Josie bombed that hard. I blame 9 11 for Josie and the Pussycats bombing like it did. It came out in April, dude. Came out in April. 9 11, dude. It's, it's always, <laughs> yeah. It's always 9 11. How dare something that happened six months later ruin the domestic intake for a movie? Are you saying 9 11 didn't change everything, Josh? Because 9 <laughs> 11 changed everything. You're right. I, I stand corrected. I'm, I'm wrong. I, I am so wrong. How, how dare I? 9 11. 9 11. Never forget. 
So, like I said, uh, I've got maybe some other little tidbits to talk about as we're watching the movie and getting into some other stuff. But um, uh, I'm getting a vibe of what our expectations are going to be going into this film. But Josh, we already, like, yeah, like actually, we kind of already been talking about our expectations. But yeah, so uh, we yeah, it's it's kind of an amorphic blob in terms of expectations and bonus material. This this episode, <laughs> yeah, it's just us shaking our heads, going, "Why?" Yeah, like I don't know. I think Tom's got it when it's just like we need to make this because we need to make this because i was reading the wikipedia page the dude who made this movie i don't even care to look his name up right now he apparently spent 10 years trying to get this movie made really and it's like i feel like he's that kid whose parents watching like a football game or into a movie or anything and then he's like the little the three-year-old toddler walks up dad can i can i use your saw and dad's like sure whatever i don't care and then he goes and cuts his arm off (laughs) and then the dad's like i didn't see this coming (laughs) It's like, what modern movie gets a $5 million budget? Especially when it's a nostalgia property. Yeah. Well, especially when you're trying, to, you're trying to capitalize on the whole Saturday morning cartoon slash toy line movies that are, were really popular at this time. Yeah, because I remember watching trailers for the movie. I remember not being impressed, but I was just like, oh, okay, Jim and the Holograms movie. I, I didn't think that would be a you know box office like runaway smash, but I at least thought it would make some moderate money because even at the time, I was acknowledging the nostalgia tidal wave of movies that had been hitting the theaters at the time. And just real quick to just talk about like how badly they missed the mark on this film. 2015, which really wasn't that long ago, but 2015... nine years ago, Dan. Nine well, I know, but I'm talking like, but I still rem- I still vividly remember 2015, whereas like if we were talking about 1985, I'd have to look things up. But in 2015, like some of the most popular female recording artists were Taylor Swift, uh, Selena Gomez, uh, Ariana Grande, Miley Cyrus, Katy Perry, Lady Gaga. All of these artists, these recording artists, hugely popular with girls. Mm-hmm. Actually, you can almost, if you just look at Lady Gaga's career, she's probably the closest thing we've ever seen to an actual real life gem in the holograms. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that she's got a completely different on stage persona than she has when she's not on stage. Yeah. Dude, you know what they should have done is they should have just got Tay Tay up there in the movie. Totally popular, guys. Like, for real. For real, yeah, Tay Tay, bro. Bro. It's funny, it's funny that Tom, Tom joked about Hannah Montana, but actually, Hannah Montana is a better. Gem and the Holograms like type show, live action show than the actual Gem and the Holograms film. Like it's just mind boggling that that all these these female artists were incredibly popular at the time, have all these catchy songs and kind of have the same kind of a persona as Gem in the cartoon show is like they have a different persona on stage than they do in real life. And yet they missed the mark on this film. Yeah. Plus 2015, you started to see that kind of like synth wave kind of the gem in the holograms aesthetic kind of coming back into pop music. So you could have blended perfectly. You wouldn't even yeah. have to change the style. She has a cell phone now. That's it. That aesthetic, still modern times, it would have worked perfectly. Yeah, I don't know. Just this entire thing just seems shoddy. Yeah. The $5 million budget just throws me off. Because you've got a big Hollywood IP. Even if you would have thrown like five times that budget, you're still at $25 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can't say say this for a fact because I haven't seen the movie. But it's like, go with like the nostalgia trip and throw in like, like you were saying, bring all the heavy female pop artists at the time in the movie too. You could throw that in there. You get them help pushing the movie. But it's like, I don't know. Like, I don't remember seeing a lot about this movie outside of the occasional uh, trailer. And it's just, it came... And a time that it should have been popular. It should have been a uh, popular movie. Given like or It should have made more than $2 million. And it should have had a budget higher than five. Right. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. This movie, like, it didn't need a $100 million budget. But Well, it could have helped. Dude, it, no, if you would have had, like I said, five times that budget. Like, what was it? The Tom Hanks film Greyhound that was released only on Apple TV had a $42 million budget. And... Like they did so much with that money. Yeah, at, at only five million dollars, you can't even hire any of those singers that I just mentioned. You're you're not going to get Mm-mm. a movie with cameos of Lady Gaga and Taylor Swift and uh, Ariana Grande and Miley Cyrus. You're not going to get them in the movie because their fees alone is going to eat up that entire five million dollars. Oh yeah, yeah I, mean, so, I mean, and then yeah. your VFX budget is gone. You don't have one at five million dollars. No, no, no. You barely yeah. have enough for costumes which dude what was that what was that one movie that had dakota fanning and the chick from twilight oh god it was like a 
It sounds oh, similar. She was. It was. The, wasn't that the movie about Joan Jett and the Heartbreakers? Yeah, like, yeah, cherry, yeah. Was it Cherry Bomb? Oh shoot, let me look this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That movie was pretty all right. Um, I'm curious to see what that uh, movie grossed real quick. But like, you were just talking about how your visual effects budget is gone at five million dollars, which is hilarious because the show Gem and the Holograms. I mean, she's it. She creates hol- She creates a hologram of herself. Or at least a different persona with her holographic earring thing that she has, this artificial AI. So, like, you don't have the budget to create that on screen at only $5 million. Imagine Transformers with a $5 million budget. Oh, wait, I have. It's called Transmorphers. So, <laughs> like, yeah, like I was saying, it's like you freaking Donnie Darko had the same budget as this well, film. Yeah. Look at Clerks, the original Clerks. Had a budget of like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, but you can do two hundred fifty thousand dollars if I'm not expected to throw fireballs out of my hand at any point yeah. in the movie. Yeah. You know. And this is okay, supposed yeah, to be yeah. a movie with it's called The Runaways. Let yeah. me see what it's on. I am or box office mojo. But yeah, The Runaways had a ten million dollar budget. It had five million more than Gem and the Holograms. Okay, but it only made 4.6 worldwide. I'm seeing a trend here. (laughs) (laughs) The world does not like uh, female band movies. I mean... (laughs) You know, this came out in 2010. Josie and the Pussycats came out in 2001. 2015, this guy comes up to you and he's like, hey, hey, I want to make a movie about an all-girl band. Like, um, here's $5 million. Go away. They give him something to work with, at least. Dude, I think that's the thing. They did. They gave... The Runaways, and that was about Cherry Curry and Jonah Jett. Yeah. 2010, so five years earlier, twice the budget of Gem and the Holograms, and it made $3.5 million domestic. So that one cost them over $5 million. The Barbie movie proves that it, you can make a movie for women based on women toy or you know female toys and products and as long as you take care of the source material and make a movie that they want to go see they will go see it and just give it buckets of money yeah you know what i mean like yeah. you know and like yeah, the but- barbie movies like gem and the holograms could have had like some like undertones of a message there as goofy as the show was i'm watching the old episodes like the show got deep in a lot of episodes there's an episode where a girl's trying to find her dad he was a gi in the vietnam war and she's trying to find who her dad is. You had like serious stuff in those. You had episodes where Jerrica is like, who does my boyfriend really love? Me or Jem? With like, yeah, the, the, the yeah I thought that too. So, so, so all I'm hearing is that Tom was a huge Jem fan. Gotcha. <laughs> there was a trend that's, with my that's sister. That's why he's so pissed, Nigel. <laughs> hey, I, you saw those music videos I sent you guys. I mean, the Misfits were badass. Again, that's just what's so frustrating. Yeah. But, you know, like, well, looking at it from a purely economic perspective, we always talk about how if the board gets involved, the movie's going to be terrible, right? Yeah. So, like, I listed off two different movies. Just those two items. Like, I'm cherry picking, but they probably had more stuff. I- I'm just, I'm not trying to justify the movie, but I'm trying to justify why their budget was so shite. Mm-hmm. Um, You've got those two movies, which they invested $40 million in Josie and the Pussycats 14 years earlier, and they made 15. So you're talking about a massive, more than 50% loss in your investment. And then the Runaways, I mean, you may be trying to pull in people from the 60s and 70s who were Jonah Jett fans. I mean, you want them to go see this movie because they were alive during that time to try to tweak that nostalgia button with them, right? So they gave it $10 million because it's not a high sci-fi thing. It's nothing that's going to involve a lot of stuff. You're getting Dakota Fanning and Christian Stewart, which I forget when Twilight came out. This would have been like the peak of Twilight. So, yeah, you're you're trying to you want to pull in people who was watching Twilight. You got Dakota Fanning. You got people, the older people wanting to do that. And it made less than half of its budget. So they lost 50 percent on that. So their market research, I'm sure again, cherry picking two movies shows that female driven band movies, you're only going to get 50 percent of your investment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So from from a pure economic perspective standpoint they're all like well you want to make this movie we're gonna go ahead and approve it but you're not gonna get the budget you want so take it or leave it sounds like he took it and then he was stuck making a coming of age movie because he couldn't afford the visual effects or anything that uh he wanted to in the movie because the man spent 10 years trying to get this movie developed Mm -hmm. it could have been a great movie they just it just needed more money so sometimes sometimes you get those movies that are made that they have such a big budget and such so much eyes on them that they're going to turn into crap, cough, cough, sequel trilogy. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes you get movies that just 
they don't need a big budget, but I feel like this one needed a bigger budget. Oh, and definitely. That's per- yes. And I'll have more to say after we actually watch the movie, but my expectations. There we is, go. We're getting to the expectations now. <laughs> I'm expecting it to feel rushed. I'm not expecting things to be flushed out. You know, going in line with Masters of the Universe, it feels like that they had very limited amount to work with, and they probably did as best as they could with what they got. Yeah. So I'm I'm willing to bet that at the end of this movie, I'm going to say, I see what they were trying for, but they failed at succeeding. That's what I'm guessing my final thoughts on this film is going to be. I think that's pretty honest estimation there. It's a shitty pizza, but at least it's a pizza. Yeah, it's a, it's a CC's pizza. It's basically spaghetti sauce on cardboard, but it'll do in a pinch. It still <laughs> sucks, but it, I see that you were trying to be a good pizza. That's a pretty, that's kind of a far more optimistic expectation than I was expecting there, Josh. Yeah, it's got a hell of a lot more optimistic than my expectation, which is <laughs> I'm feeling like this is going to be a two hour fan trailer for a YouTube video. Honestly, I, I don't expect to like this movie. I'm hoping, expecting to be able to say, I see what they were going for. Or I could see the better movie that this wanted to be, but this still sucks. Because uh, I mean, at the end of the day, if I'm going to CC's Pizza, I'm still getting spaghetti sauce on cardboard. But at least it's uh, at least it's something. It'll be like Nighthawks. If this movie sucks, I'm not going to be apologist for it, like you guys were with Nithix. Because <laughs> this is, again, what they delivered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. I had high expectations for Nithix, but I was severely disappointed in that film. I'm saying, remember, with the whole Nithix thing, you guys were like, I could see the movie that this tried to be. Yeah. But I'm already thinking that this movie could be could have been better had it had more love given to it mm-hmm, in the form mm-hmm. of money and attention. Nigel, your thoughts, your expectations. Uh, <laughs> um, You've been kind of in group dis- or expectations for like this entire time. I, my expectations are, are very, very low. Like this just, I don't think this is going to be good. I don't even think we're going to see the good movie. This was trying to be, we're just going to see the bad movie that it is because no care was put into this film. No money was put into this film. No one gave a shit about it. And I think it's going to come out on screen that no one gave a shit about this movie. Like we we've watched plenty of bad films, quote unquote, bad films on this channel. But like sometimes it's not the director's fault. or Sometimes it's not the studio's fault that they weren't given a whole lot of money, but they made the best of what with what they had. But I don't think this is going to be one of those cases. This is going to be R- Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. It's going to be a movie that was made because they were afraid to lose the license. It's going to feel like a movie that was made because they were afraid to lose the license. Mm-hmm. And unlike Roger Corman's um, Fantastic Four, I don't think it's going to have that so bad it's good quality. I think it's just going to be so bad it's bad. So um, I don't think it's going to touch on any of the deep stuff that the show even kind of touched on. Like Tom was saying, you know, like you could have made a whole movie about the fact that maybe she doesn't want to be Jim. Maybe she wants to make music as Jerrica and not Jim, but Jim makes her money and she needs the money because of the orphanage. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, or she has to like know. struggle between like, is she doing more good as Jerrica, the owner of starlight productions or starlight music or as Jim and Jim and the holograms, where does yeah. she want to be as herself? Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Because There's so many possibilities for what they could, yeah. Yeah, because they, done. they've done stories like that with with uh, male. Like, I, I say superheroes, but Jem is not a superhero. You know, there's a whole He-Man episode about that called, you know, The Courage of Adam. Like where Adam, ta- you know, wonders, you know, who's the real person? Is it Prince Adam or is it He-Man? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, you can wrestle with those. You can make that kind of a, a film and do those kinds of stories. But I don't think they didn't do that in this one. And it's, it's going to be bad. It's, I, I just really think it's going to be bad. And it's not going to be like other movies where they were so bad. That we had some, we still managed to have some fun watching it. I think we're going to have a lot of laughs at this movie's expense tonight. I don't <laughs> think oh, yeah. Do oh yeah. I can almost guarantee you that. You know, what about you, Tom? <sighs> I'm having to center myself now. We know you're a big Gem fan. He's, he was the only one with sisters, though, so he would yeah. have the most knowledge of this show. Like, I'm giving him shit, but yes. But no, yeah. but Josh is not wrong. I did like this show. It was always a weird trend growing up. Like my sisters would be in a cartoon or a series, like um, Kim Possible or Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and I just look like. Psh. This is dumb. And then by episode five, like, oh my god, did you see yeah, the latest episode? Oh my god. 
<laughs> that was like to me, me and to my me, daughter was... watching My Little Pony. Yes. Yeah, honestly, I don't have the nostalgia for this show, but sh- one show I did have nostalgia for, and I really enjoyed the uh, Netflix reimagining of it, was She-Ra. Right. Now I know that She-Ra was a spinoff of He-Man, that she's He-Man's twin sister, and that show was made for girls, but like I ended up liking it, and I had some nostalgia for it. Yeah. And I even I even had a She-Ra doll. Like, she was supposed to be a doll. She was definitely more Action doll-like than the- figure. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, yeah, but she was- but like I had her because I had to, I had to complete the set, the, mm-hmm. the, you know, I wanted a She-Ra toy. So, yeah, but that's no different than me than girls who also like Star Wars or like the Marvel films or whatever. Like just because it's made with boys or men in the expectations doesn't mean girls can't like it. And just because it's made with girl with women or girls in mind doesn't mean men can't like it. So yeah, yeah there's nothing wrong with liking Gem and the Hologram. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. And eighties, you know, going to Shiro too. Eighties Shiro was pretty badass too, but that's the thing for me. It's like, I, looking at the script for this I, i've seen these sorts of stories told in the 80s and 90s like you know when, you're, when you have your pop star protagonist that has to realize the music was in them the whole time it's like find their true selves take off the makeup and the wig and such and sing from the heart and remember who they are it's it's going to be one of those stories and those stories are fine there is nothing wrong with a salad for dinner but I'm not here for the salad. I ordered pizza. <laughs> that isn't cardboard and, and spaghetti sauce. Well, hell, at this point, I would take cardboard and spaghetti sauce as a pizza. And they're giving me a salad. It's not a wild salad. It's a pretty basic salad. Not a lot of croutons, and some bacon here and there, but not too much. And it's going to be fine. For what it's going to be, I'm sure it's going to be Fine. As you said, Josh, working with what they have. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to be what I ordered. No. And that's going to just sting so hard watching this. We've had some fun movies we've watched that have been dumb, that have been bad films, but they've been fun bad. This just... Watchable. Yes. Thank you, Josh. Watchable would be the best term. And I figured... Not Art of War. No, that's... (laughs) No, no, not not the mummy. Art of, War, Art of War still has some pretty decent action scenes in it. You know, the mummy had some pretty impressive special effects. Bad film, but there's parts of it like I can hang on to and be like, hmm. okay, they didn't do that too bad. But that was balanced out by the incompetence. It, there were fun, dumb moments and just really incompetent moments. This film's going to mm-hmm. be competent, but just beige. <laughs> Which, or gem in the holograms should not be beige at all that said i am actually looking forward to some of the actresses in this movie because just researching in advance just seeing what they had done before this movie as i said in my production and i do apologize to the listeners i didn't really give a lot because it's just there wasn't really a lot to say it's just they kind of plucked them they were the cheapest and they were there Uh, None of them, none of these girls really had much pop music or music experience before this. But looking at some of them, they've actually kind of pivoted a little bit into their roles. Uh, Aubrey Peoples, who is playing Jerrica slash Jem, has actually gone on to become a YouTube singer and such. She's actually got an alternate personality called Swamps, whose music is very very much like Jim and the Holograms. And you've got uh, Haley Kikio as AJ, who is the lead guitarist in the movie. But after this, she's she's got kind of a pretty big YouTube career. She's got like 2.3 million subscribers. Hmm, interesting. And yeah, her music is also very poppy. It's kind of like uh, Image and Heap um, kind of sound to it with a little Tessa Violet. Again, just really good stuff. So it's weird to see that this movie may not have done what they wanted to do, but in its own way, it did do something for the actresses in this movie. So I'm kind of looking forward to seeing that and just, you know, maybe getting a little value out of that. Other than that, no, if I wasn't watching this with you guys, I wouldn't be watching it at all. Oh yeah. Just remember, you're the one who recommended this movie. I did, Josh. I did, and we're all probably going to regret that by the end of this. I I just don't want to be bored. I just don't want to be bored by this film. And I'm afraid we're going to get bored. Probably. 
but those are my expectations. Yeah, maybe there'll be some good music in here. Maybe the trailer's wrong. Maybe it just had a bad trailer. Because we've had movies before where it's just like the trailer just didn't make any sense, didn't really sell us on the movie. But then we've seen the movie and just went, holy shit, I wish I'd seen this in theaters. Yeah, like it may end up being a hidden gem. I doubt it. <laughs> Considering they pulled the plug on this movie two weeks in. But that could also be, again, a economic-based move. We don't want to invest any more money in this movie because they probably have to pay to keep movies in theaters. That's, and it was just like, okay, this is now costing us more money just to stay out. That's what I was thinking, too. You talked about, like, it's a 71% drop. At that point, even the projectionist is leaving the theater. And so, yeah, it's like, it's costing us money to keep this film running, guys. Just... Just don't even send us the prints back. Just burn them. It's going to cost too much. Yeah. All right. Well, just like I'm sitting at the doctor uh, waiting for them to give me a shot or I'm in a Civil War era hospital tent and I already know I'm going to lose my leg. Uh, let's just get this over with. And uh, Tom, play the music. <laughs> Showtime Synergy! And welcome back to another glamorous episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and music producer disguised as a pop singer and also runs an orphanage who may or may not have built Skynet and is running on four hours of sleep for the past three weeks because despite being a multi-millionaire, I never have enough money to keep lights on because do you know how much it costs to keep a fully safety AI running on a computer built on 80s technology and synthesizers and also two days ago it tried to Google how to make waffles blue and now it won't stop shooting my kids with CDs made of death. When will this sniper of life stop? I only ever wanted to be an account. Content. Tom, and thank you for jamming out with us here at the Fire Pit. Masters of the Universe may be getting ready to take the stage, but we're rocking the keytars and going glam rock tonight with Gem and the Holograms on our Super Saturday Super Power Hour. You want it outrageous? Maybe you get outrageous. And speaking of outrageous, let's sneak backstage with the team to see what outrageous shenanigans they're getting into now. We interrupt this broadcast for a special report. I'm rather not. And now we go live to Joan Walanowski on the scene. Joan? Thanks, Rather. I'm here at the St. Jesus Memorial Hospital in what can only be described as a massacre. Hundreds of children, maimed and dismembered, fill the emergency ward beyond capacity. All victims of Constable Guillotine. I'm Dr. Bushy. I've been with this hospital for over 20 years and I've never seen anything like this. Ever since they came out with these Constable Guillotine toys, I've had nurses tripping over each other to get to the patients. Literally. Just, just look at the floors. Our drains weren't meant to handle this much blood. Guillotine fever has taken the playground by storm. Millions of kids tune in every Saturday to watch Constable Guillotine and his friends as they battle the evil Robosphere in future space France. Here we have young Tony Smalls. He was admitted yesterday with severe la... la... injuries. I got this new chopper copter for my birthday yesterday. Yeah, you're supposed to pull the string and it will fly by itself. It's got really cool retractable razor rotors to make it go super high. Yeah, my mom said we couldn't play with it inside, so we went to my friend Caleb's house instead, and he's got this big fireplace. That's very cute, Tony. He was brought in yesterday with three of his friends, all yeah, admitted with I the was same just injuries. Telling them Shh, I'm talking. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, we were playing with it and we were trying to, you know, get the the catcher net out of the rotors, but Caleb, you know, accidentally pulled the string and then it started to fly really high. Then it wouldn't stop. And and then the screaming. Caleb. Okay, Tony, that's enough for cable TV. Who um, has some hankering for some sliced frog? What what what's this? You might have missed. But you're on Robot Spears' list. Chug Chud! Wow! Constable Guillotine and the Freedom Friends! Hey, little man. We heard that there was a brave little boy who's uh, been having a tough day, so our publicist said we would really help our image if we came down to... Have some toys to brighten up your day. Everybody loves these toys. 
The Widowmaker playset? Cool! And the batteries are already inside. It might say batteries not included, but we hooked you up, Tony. Hey! And don't forget, your very own Chud the Talking Head Bucket! I'm a bucket! Yeah, I don't want this. Oh. Well, it seems the creators of the controversial show Constable Guillotine have come to the hospital today. So, guys, what do you say about all of this? I mean, I mean, obviously, this is tragic. It's just tragic. Uh, so many kids suffering like this. It just, uh, it, honestly, it, it, it breaks my heart. You know, you hate to see so many kids taken down so senselessly like this. And that's why we, the cast of Constable Guillotine, promise that 10% of the proceeds for our toy sales for the next seven days are going to go towards cancer research and treatment so that one day kids like young Tony here can lead and live a full and beautiful life. Cancer stands on a razor's edge. Okay, um, yes, that's that's right, but what about all the maimings caused by your toys? The what now? All of these children here, all of them were caused by injuries sustained playing with your toys. Maimings? I thought this was the cancer ward. Why do you think that so many kids here are missing fingers? Because of the cancer, right? Yeah, fingers. Oh my eye! But wait, what are you doing? Why are you putting your eye in the guillotine? I didn't! Oh, that's right. It launches the guillotine. Oh, right. I remember now. Yeah, they wanted us the eye stuff might be a problem. But hey, look at it this way. It's not cancer. High five. I don't have any fingers. Oh, God. From the cancer, right? I heard screaming. What's going on? Damn it, not another one. Nurse, we need another bucket. Oh, oh, I've got one right here. Chuck craves blood. Yeah, we should go. Help find more buckets. Yeah, uh, good luck, Tony. Uh, we know you'll get back on your feet and no... Oh, God, your feet. Wait, wait. So, like, is the guillotine a sword or is the sword a guillotine? Yes. 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 I guess this is live from St. Jesus Memorial Hospital. I've been Joan Walinowski. Back to you, rather. Thank you, Joan. Tragic scene at the hospital indeed. Those douchebags. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming, already in progress. The season finale premiere of Constable Guillotine. Heads over heels. What do you mean I'm not allowed backstage? It's the interspersal section. I'm the interspersal host. My name is on the bloody segment. Resafersa. <sighs> but if you want to be sure all the right people have access to your products, or if you just want to give a backstage look at what's going on with you and yours, or if you just want to sneak backstage to tell us that we're having a great show, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line, as well as why you're emailing us, whether it's to buy some ad space, sell some free advice, or let us know all the shenanigans that rival podcasts are getting into and knock it our way. From there, we'll read it, set it to a snappy 80s synth pop beat, perform it for a stadium of adoring fans all screaming for more, and never respond. Turns out that one wasn't exactly a hit with the fans. Maybe write us a catchier email next time? But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. God damn it. Our AI just finished listening to our Tombot episodes and is now on a murder rage. Again. I'm gonna go troubleshoot our computer. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. All right, Synergy, time to give you a hard reboot. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. I make videos because 
I feel my estrogen levels riding watching this movie. Tom, edit that out. Aunt Bailey took us in. Now there's only one missing piece. It lacked the appropriate ingredient. Energon. A better film, Josh. But your dad was always talking about- Why does she keep saying was? He didn't actually die, he just noped out of this film. He's fine. He's fine. Truly, truly, truly outrageous. Yeah, she said the thing. She said the thing. She said the thing. Was, oh was Jesus like... Christ! This movie fucking peaked at ten minutes. Oh my god! <laughs> this is gonna be such a long film. You are no rock star, Aunt Billy. Just why are you drinking coffee at ten no, o'clock at night? Listen. This isn't coffee. There's, some ideas. <laughs> some voices There's a reason they call her Aunt Bailey. <laughs> yeah, you'll understand when you're older. Funny how realizing that your life might fall apart gives you new perspective. Oh, so this movie's a super villain story. Okay. Well, this is a weird twist on the source material. So what are we going to do tomorrow night? Kill all the Autobots. Wait, what? This gem video is magic. 36,000 freaking people just saw my necklace. 30,000 hits on YouTube, Josh. Tom, that was like 2015. Like, for real. That was like... Given inflation, like Biden's economy, that's like almost 60,000 views. For real. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that's exactly how inflation works. Uh, guys, something's happening with the internet. That you really need to see. There are these two girls, and they've got this cup. <laughs> it's weird. Here, watch this. I want to record your reaction. <laughs> Gross. The coordinates take us over there. Oh, it was haunted looking section of the pier. Yeah, this is the pier in LA. Where are all the homeless people? I would have never guessed that coming here would mean a whole new Jerrica. You mean Jem. Oh my god. <laughs> Guys, we don't have the budget for multiple takes. Just <laughs> roll with it. Come on. <laughs> I never thought I'd watch an entire movie that makes me miss Shia LaBeouf's acting, but here we are. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Things have taken a very, very hard turn for us. I love Jem. Music is amazing. Like real music. Everyone there was really one song. Everything. Rocky Purple, being red, broke and Rocky Five makes more it. sense than this movie. Guys, I think this is my dad's guitar. Are you serious? How can you tell? Well, okay. How would her dad know up. that she would one day sing in that exact hall and look at that exact guitar? Dan, 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 Dan. The movie only works if you don't overthink it. Oh my God, my head <laughs> hurts. <laughs> like, unless your the... fucking dad was a time traveler, this isn't making any sense. <laughs> what is this movie? <laughs> How'd you know we were here? Left my iPhone in the glove compartment, tracked it all the way here, and it's my Wait, job. If your phone was in number. the glove compartment, how were you able to track it? Tom, the movie only works if you don't overthink it. Showtime synergy. Can, can you let my mom go now? I said the line. I want to die. <laughs> <laughs> now are you channeling the character, Dan, or his... No, no, his character is, he's a member of a three-person podcast, and he's forced to sit and watch Jim and the Holograms. <laughs> that is your motivation. Go. <laughs> what is that? It's my dad's will. Oh, now we have a new new subplot, guys. Because we don't have 15 already. I'm going to make a bold prediction here. Out of all of these subplots being introduced into the movie, exactly none of them will have any satisfying conclusions. It's just dick pics. Everything is dick pics. <laughs> <laughs> so you wouldn't just be losing the house, you would lose everything. Oh, that's right, we were supposed to save out. the house and shit. How's yeah. that coming along? You see the boxes in the They background. forgot about her. <laughs> After she said, don't you forget about me. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Welcome to the so we're an hour and a half into a two-hour movie, and we have our first what? hologram. Gentlemen, we have our first hologram. <laughs> Mission accomplished. We did it, guys. We finally got the holograms in Gem and the holograms. Ladies and gentlemen. We got him. We got him. <laughs> in July 1973, the Everly Brothers self-destructed in front of a sold-out crowd. 
Can we watch that? That sounds awesome. Holy shit. That sounds, awesome. shit. Yeah. That sounds like a great movie. A great story. Let's watch that. No, we have Jim. Thank you, Tom. Somebody once told me that. <laughs> you cannot use us as an excuse for lying. That's not how a family is supposed to work. Actually, this that's can, kind of what families do. It's a lot of lying in family. Also, she's gonna be she's gonna be rich and famous, and you guys are just gonna be the hangers on. That's also what family does. Yeah. Santa Monica Boulevard. I don't remember what song that was from. I just remember that line from the song. Josh, you doing all right there? No. I promised you the truth of who I really am. And the truth is... I am Iron Man. I mean... <laughs> Better movie. If you're seeing this, then a curious little girl... This could have been an email. Yeah. <laughs> Remove Miss Raymond from the concert. Get her for a pair of cement shoes and throw her over the pier. Wait, what? No, no. We don't do that. We just, just, just escort her out of the building. And burn her at the stake. Okay, Zipper, seriously, dude, we've had this talk before. You gotta bring it down. We are, we are, the hope of the nation. That's youth of the nation, Josh. I don't listen to a lot of music. <laughs> Neither does anyone who made this movie. What would they like to call the band? Oh my god, is he gonna say the name? Is he gonna title drop? How about Jim and the Holograms? He said the line! He said the line! Oh god, everything's on fire! Oh no! This is not part of the show! That's not a pirate no, Seriously, guys, everybody needs to go. Don't stand in anything west. Jemmy Rule! She was all over me, by the way. She's 17, dude. Jumping off the pier, oh there's no way that anyone. Oh god! Okay, we you weren't supposed to jump. That's like we we're gonna cut to Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so despite being wet and cold, uh, the cops are still looking for us. Can we maybe go home? No? Okay, we'll just freeze to death. That's fine. Yeah, you didn't swim that far away, guys. You're still at the pier. Is anyone else sitting on some needles? I'm sitting on needles. <laughs> I literally can't feel my toes. They're they're turning black. Can we readdress the hypothermia thing from earlier, guys? Are your toes turning black because of frostbite? No, I think it's the needles I'm sitting in. Also, the the water was actually a little more shallow than it looked, so I think I have a concussion. No, you see, actually what's happening is they're thinking this is happening. They actually have severe, like, uh, infection going to their brains, and they're all, like, writhing on the uh, beach. Going, <laughs> <laughs> they're in severe hypothermic shock. <laughs> like, this is what's going on. Yeah. Like, they're just rolling in the sand. Just, like, <laughs> like guttural sounds is all this no. coming out. The cops they are have... watching this being like, yeah, ambulance? <laughs> bring it. We, need, we need another ambulance. <laughs> they haven't even surfaced yet. They're still under the water. <laughs> they're just floating <laughs> on that's... top. You see bubbles. They all jumped in with those heavy boots on, so they sank like stones all the way down <laughs> to the bottom. So they're just sitting there fucking having a drowning fever dream. Also, what happened to the robot? It died on impact. <laughs> a mercy. <laughs> Can I stop the recording, guys, yeah. please? No, I need I need these names, Josh. Someone needs to be held accountable for this. <laughs> Kevin Bird, you're on the list. And now, Fire Pit Podcast proudly presents The Plight of the Pizza. It's time for another fashion montage. Yeah, yeah. Walk that runway. Strut those heels. You know, watching all these girls get told that they're fat and struggling to lose weight, I'm going to order a pizza. <laughs> did we lose Nigel? No, or did, did no. Did we lose but, Nigel? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm trying to find my wallet so I can find my company card so I can pay for my pizza. He's doing anything else but watch this movie. When's my pizza going to get here? <laughs> Don't worry about pausing it, guys. I'm just going to go eat the whole fucking thing. <laughs> to the extreme, I rock a mic like a vandal. Light up the stage and watch me jump like a candle. Seriously, when's my pizza getting here? <laughs> Plight of the pizza. Better movie than this. <laughs> So, Dan, is there an update on the story of your plight of the pizza? <laughs> yes, please. Please give us something better. It's on its way. It should be here in like 15 minutes. Is Carlos on his way with your pizza? 
Actually, I think it's probably it's probably being delivered by one of the girls in this movie. <laughs> oh, hey, I'm watching your movie. <laughs> oh yeah, hey, I know you. You were uh, you're in that gem movie. I'm watching it right now. What were you like, Aria or a blah 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 blah? Sir, it's going to be twenty seven fifty for the pizza. I already paid on the card. I gave you a tip. I gotta get back upstairs and unpause this train wreck. Sorry, it's a it's one of the role where you're speaking. I didn't need to pause it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this makes. No fucking sense. I, I know that's we've been okay, saying that. Dan, we get it. Not, Your not, pizza not, is on its way. No, it's on not, its way, Dan. I know, Josh. I'm not talking about the pizza. I'm Can we please about, talk about the pizza, okay. though? <laughs> oh, my God. How's your pizza coming along, Dan? It's yeah. not here. I need it so bad. <laughs> I, I want to go home. <laughs> Hey, can we pause this for a minute? Actually, it should be downstairs here in just a second, so I gotta go get it. I really, really, really want to know the end of the story of the plight of the pizza. <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> Is that Nigel? Please, please. I need to know. Pepperoni? The meat lovers? Please tell me, did he get a supreme? Oh, I am I bet it's stuffed crust. I bet oh, there's... Oh, all the anticipation oh. is killing me. Oh. Did he get it from Pizza Hut or Papa John's? Oh. Or did he get a local pizza place? Ooh. Ooh. Oh. Did, is that one of those, like, you know, underground gems? Oh, in, like, yeah. That's just, Portland. like, so yeah. good. With the artis artisanal, like, basil and, you know, rosemary and... In, in the crust. Oh. Yeah, and, and it's like special like olive oil on the crust. And oh. it's like you pick it up and it like drips. Oh, and it's got those like those pepperoni that curl up so there's that pool of oil just oh, right Oh, yeah, and it just like, ooh, ooh, with a little bit of the like hot, hot honey on oh. it. Oh. the hot honey pizza. Oh, yeah. Glazed on the crust. Oh, yeah. Oh. We were invested in this now. Do you think he got it like the, the standard cut? Where it was cut into like, like arcs, like triangle pieces, or or do you think he got it Chicago cut, cut in squares? Oh, it's got to be the squares. The squares are the best cut. Yeah. Got but that. if he got that, and he got it stuffed crust, then it's, like that that's that's more crust per pizza. But then, but then you don't get to enjoy the crust with the pizza. It's like a trade off. What did he do? Dan, hurry up and get here. We need to know. Okay, I'm here. I'm good. Okay, Dan, Dan. The period from when you left when getting back has been like the period from Infinity War to Endgame. All the speculation, <laughs> we need to know. Where did you order the pizza from? What kind of pizza did you get? Did you get the hot honey pizza? What's the crust? Tell us about the crust. I got a I Pizza Hut thin crust pizza and I got boneless wings. I ordered <gasps> leftovers so that I could take it to work tomorrow for lunch. <laughs> well, what kind of pizza? Sausage, Sausage pepperoni, and bacon. Meat lovers. Oh, I should have known. With a side of chicken wings. I'm standing up and I'm clapping. That's just. I'm clapping. I'm clapping. We got a round of applause here, guys. All right, end the episode. We did it. <laughs> yeah, the plight <laughs> of the pizza is over. We don't need to finish Jim and the Holograms. <laughs> the, re the real Jim and the Holograms was the pizza we ordered along the way. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> All right, let's turn on this. Although, now that my peach is here, the last interesting thing that was going to happen in this movie happened. <laughs> let's just be honest. This is going to be a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> and now, back to the episode. Okay, that entire, like, after credit scene was better than the whole movie. Right? Yeah, actually, it, it actually was the most entertaining part of this film. I yes. It. I like, it. It, it made me feel like there was actually substance to the movie. And it, it, it gave me some kind of a corny plot to look forward to. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Any final thoughts? <laughs> no, it really would have made, really made more sense if they showed at some point earlier in the film her kicking that band out to get to sign Jim. Like, it would have, that, that whole right, sequence. Guys, let's, 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 yeah, Dan, see, you we, we got final me. thoughts coming. I'm stopping this right now. All right, so um, that was a movie, and that movie <laughs> yes. was called Gem and the Holograms. Yes, you are right. If, of all the movies we've watched, that was certainly one of them. Yes, barely. Barely, but it was. So um, 
leading off final thoughts tonight, I um, am going to let Tom. Tom, what are <sighs> you picked this movie? I did, and I I want to say, for I am sorry. I'm mis- mistakes were made. Um, okay, you're, you're sorry. You're sorry for picking the movie, but you're not sorry because this is going to be a great episode. It will be a fantastic yeah. episode. Yeah. So, yeah, like, but, but what at what cost? Know. That's. I mean, um, it's, it's you know, flowers need manure to grow. So. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> oh Lord. Oh Lord. Oh, I need to arrange my thoughts because I have so many. Oh. You know how I said in the beginning that the worst this film could be would be boring and bland? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was exactly the worst it could have been. <laughs> oh, it was such a slog. Oh, I'm going to start just by saying this is definitely a Bloomhouse film. Hey, apologies to listeners just with the rambling of my production earlier and just missing a lot of beats. It's the frustration that just built Bloomhouse productions. They do horror films mostly, low budget stuff. They did the um, latest uh, Five Nights at Freddy's film and a bunch of other hit or miss, you know, horror films. But Bloomhouse has never found a corner that they couldn't cut. Those guys could squeeze pennies out of a dime. It is impressive what they can do. And I'm not going to lie. I was really impressed. I didn't mention in the productions that they had got Chris, you know, that Chris Pratt and Jimmy Fallon and The Rock were in this film. Because I figured, oh, it's just going to be, you know, newsreel footage. It's like them walking the red carpet. They're one of those things. So I was really surprised when I saw Chris Pratt, I mean, on TV, not in the film itself, but like you know, talking about Gem and the Holograms and The Rock and such. I was, whoa, this is pretty impressive. And then Nigel, uh, what was it that you told me? Uh, what was that little bit of trivia you said about all that um, regarding those recordings? Oh, they were all... Um... Well, they were duped. Yeah, some of those were previous interviews that had nothing to do with this film. Yeah. Dick moves that they did like that to just stretch a dollar. And those, those weird scenes, they used it several times for the movie. They just stole clips from the internet as their background bullshit things. Like, probably cost them all of a dime. Not even that. Not so- even. No. It probably cost more for them to send out the tweet, because it was Twitter at the time, mm-hmm. to... Then actually uh, an editing time. Yeah. Yeah. It just all oh, the corner cutting in this film. There were some parts that I did like you know, the, with the recording and everything else to like make it more of a grounded feel while also like working around the limitations. But there were a lot of times, especially when they're using those YouTube video stuff, you really felt them cutting corners to make this film. And it's True. just fucking hell that's top of my head and this movie had no idea where it wanted to go or what it wanted to do it was five different subplots in a trench coat it just (laughs) and just third i said to the watch it felt like someone took a 20 minute episode of the cartoon and just tried to stretch it out to two hours as best as they can and it didn't need to be It could have shaved like a half hour of the film or an hour or an hour and a half or two hours. They should have just not made the film. They should have just not made the film. (laughs) It took him 10 minutes to get to that point. Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm waiting for him to say he's offended by this film. I think the offending is applied, Josh. I'm I'm not going to take all the thoughts um, because there's a lot of meat on these bones here. So, uh, Fuck this movie. Yeah. <laughs> yes, fuck this movie. It was the worst of the worst it could be. Nigel, what are your thoughts? Um I hate it. <laughs> I hate it so much. <laughs> like I I usually hate when someone say like, you know, on behalf of other marginalized groups, I'm offended when you're not a part of that marginalized group. But I'm sorry, ladies. 
as, on behalf of women who were one time little girls who loved Jim and the holograms, I am offended for you on your behalf for this film. I got like a half dozen so far of at best mediocre Transformers movies, but I never got anything this bad. <laughs> you know, and one like, of those concussed us. Yeah. Like, like the worst Transformer movie is still like better than more and more entertaining than anything that was on screen in this slog. This movie was awful. It was awful. It was awful. It was offensive. It was just fuck. It just like almost nearly every scene just started pissing me off because like th- like Tom said, they had a hundred different subplots that all went nowhere. And I I, was, I said it. I was like, none of these is going to have a satisfying conclusion at the end. No, <laughs> you, call, you guys called it. Yeah, I, yeah. No, and like the timeline made no sense. It, at some points, it seemed like they'd been rock stars for months. Other times, it seemed like they had been rock stars for a couple of weeks. Sometimes it seemed like all the events of the movie took place in the span of one week. Like it just made no sense. The timeline made no sense, especially that that near the end where she becomes like a quote unquote solo artist and her friends or her sisters get in the car and they're driving back to the suburb, which is implied to be pretty far away from L.A. And they're driving all the way back home. And then she has her moment of crisis where she's crying and she does all this stuff and she's trying to call them on the phone and they don't answer the phones and all that. And then she goes to her old house and then she just starts breaking down on the stoop or the stairs or whatever. And then the other sister says, I thought I'd find you here. And I'm like, it was shot in such a way that it made it seem like all of that happened in one night. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, there's no fucking way it could have happened in one night. The girls were a hundred miles in the opposite direction. There's no fucking way they got to her before the sun came up the next day. Right. So yeah, this movie just pissed me off. It pissed me off. And like I said, on behalf of all the uh, Gen X and, and millennial women out there who at one point in time there were little girls in the mid eighties to early, uh, early nineties who loved this show. I am offended for you. Because you got Jim and the holograms. Like, <laughs> I'm so offended by this. Like, this movie just pissed me off. It, you know, it just made no sense. Like I said, we'll get, I'll get them into more when we get into some other thoughts. Because I'm going to start to ramble. But honestly, I'm really curious about Josh over here. Because yes. He, he was the most <laughs> optimistic of all of us. And he's been kind of quiet. So I'm kind of like wondering, is he having a crisis of conscience right now, or, you know, he's, uh, you know, tying a noose on his ceiling or something. So let's, uh, let's, let's see, Josh, what are your final thoughts of this film? I think I'm in a hotel room. I'm watching this and I'm understanding why David Carradine hung himself. (laughs) (laughs) Two outside jokes. But yeah, too soon. No. Um, okay. So, uh, I'm really contemplating the last two hours. Mm -hmm. Um, I I just, I really want to say I enjoyed this film because then I could, you know, not regret the last two hours. (laughs) I really feel wronged if I say I hate this movie. So this was a great movie. Um, (laughs) I truly felt that the way that the director went about doing a single take for absolutely every single scene <laughs> was inspired. Um, Cause getting their honest reaction to every single take didn't look forced at all. It wasn't forced. It looked, looked authentic. And the way they delivered their lines with such monotone clarity was <laughs> It's like they hadn't even had time to rehearse before they shot. Yeah, it felt... You know how people love those movies like uh, Best in Show? Those improv movies, right? Yeah. This is nothing like that because those are good. (laughs) Yeah. I am physically hurt by this film. Um, Seriously, the acting felt so one take. Mm -hmm. Like, I felt like there were certain points where it's just like, okay, um, the director needed to come in on the screen and be like, I'm so sorry for this scene. We literally had $50 for the budget on this. Um, I'm sorry. It felt like, it honestly felt like porn acting. No, porn acting is more convincing. (laughs) Yeah, but like porn acting is literally just 
like, like the dialogue is just we just need to say a couple of lines to make to make any excuse in the world for why these two people or three people or eight, eight people need to have sex. You just need to say stepmother. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Just say it. And but then, oh my god. And then, things, that's it. So that's what the dialogue felt like in this movie. Yeah, at least with porn dialogue and such. One, there's emotion there, there, and enthusiasm, and because they're gonna they get to have sex and they get yeah. to have sex. They get to have sex. Like the subplots just hurt. Like, okay, I'll admit the after credit scene, Mm -hmm. the way that was done, I would have loved to see the whole movie with that feel. Yeah. I need you to destroy Jim and the holograms. Like campiness. But the problem was, it's like the movie didn't know what it was. It tried to take itself way too seriously. Like I saw what it wanted to be. It wanted to be this emotional coming of age story about this girl who wanted to be something better, but she didn't want to hide behind this facade. I get what you were going for. But the movie didn't need to be that serious. Like, you could have kept it almost like that, but give it a little bit more campiness. Nobody wants something, like, super serious like that. Mm -hmm. And then, like, that last scene with the misfits, that felt like the movie I wanted to see. Yeah. The way that they were, like, you know, strutting up, like, you got rid of us. And then, okay, I'll admit that one chick, what's her face? The Erica whatever, Raymond, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her character, it was like not quite the like mustache twirling villain, but she was very campy. And I love the way she played her role, but everybody else was like too dead serious. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, this, it should have been a lot campier. Jim and the hologram should have had more of a villain in the role. There shouldn't have been, the antagonist shouldn't have been as buried as it was. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Because the problem was, is the villain, the Erica Raymond, she wasn't the villain until. She never really was the villain. No, no. You know, there really wasn't an antagonist in this film. Yeah, that's whole things like, I want you to be a solo artist. That that was it. That was a whole thing. Yeah. And it's like they threw in that whole Will thing at the end where they, just for the audience sake, what happened was they put her fucking earrings in a safe at the beginning of the movie for some reason. And they had to do this weird heist thing and go get the earrings. Mm -hmm. Made no fucking sense, but they needed a third act. So they broke in. For reasons and he found the will his father left that apparently left him the company which was never discussed during his funeral or by the lawyers no nothing and will? it was just like and then it was just like this curveball at the very end of the movie where it's like dad wanted me to have the studio and it's just like the fuck did this come from then it's like suddenly she's the bad guy but it's like if she would have been more antagonistic or or even like, Dan, you had it. They should have fired the misfits at the beginning when they saw the video. But honestly, mm-hmm. the frame well, that would have made sense. That, that, that would have just made more sense because yeah. they, they weren't doing anything in this movie that made sense. That just that's just dumb. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, the movie premise has merit. This could have been a good movie. What they delivered was shit. Oh, my God. Yes. Like, yes. honestly, I you give me a movie based around that last fucking 30 second mid credit scene. I would love the fuck out of that. You give me something with actual holograms and like some Hannah Montana back and forth. That's campy, corny, and it's over the top. Mm-hmm, fucking mm-hmm. D Snyder over the top. I would have fucking ate that up. Like my last bit. And then we can go into group is just like this movie could have been so much better. What we got was garbage. Like seriously, they need to reboot this film. Yes. Jim and the Holograms, not this movie, but the actual IP deserves a better movie. Make it campy, make it whatever. I don't care. It doesn't need to be the realistic Transformers or the realistic G.I. Joes. You can make this campy. I don't care. I want to see that movie. I would pay to go see that movie because like I said, I enjoyed the after credit scene just because it was so campy and corny. You give me somebody to root against. There was nobody to root against. Mm -hmm. So it's like the conflict wasn't there and the conflict was resolved way too quickly. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any emotional investment in this film. Yeah. That's just it. I had no emotional investment. Okay, we can go on to group group thoughts now. Well, like I was thinking the same thing. There was no emotional investment in this movie because there was almost no character in this movie that had any kind of a character development or character arc. No. Like the characters don't do anything. They're just there to further the plot along. Like, I don't know. It's just... They yeah, don't, they, they had the generic don't... traits enough. You had the hacker, you had the sister, you had the other sister. Barely. Yeah. Dude, look at the movie Rockstar. Him being introduced to the whole thing had much better pace than this entire film. Like if the first act, if it would have been an homage to Rockstar, like they took like the entire opening of Rockstar 
and just not recreated it, but like act one was the movie Rockstar. That mm-hmm. would have been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then introduce the villain and then act two is the rising conflict. Yeah. And then like, you know, climax in the act three. Yeah. But it's like, there was one scene at the very beginning of the movie that made me think of Rockstar. And it's that scene when Erica was explaining to them as they were about to step out of the limo at the very first time, stand back, lean on your back leg, do this, do that. And the girls were like looking outside the thing and they were like bright eyed and they were like super excited. I felt like that was a well done scene for about 30 seconds, (laughs) 20 seconds. That was it. And then it's like, everything went to shit after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. That goes back to you were saying it took itself too seriously. Yes. Gem and the holograms always had an episode where it's like they would always have to do like a show or, you know, make a movie so they could, you know, save this orphan or save the company from the evil CEO guy. There was always that subplot, but there was that camp that went with it, too. That joy. Also... Released with the cartoon, they stuck with one subplot. Then they just worked with it. This, How many subplots did this movie have, guys? At least, at least a dozen. And then it's like, they finished the whole fucking Mac and Me subplot. And it's just like, what happened to the robot? Yeah. Yeah, they had the fetch quest subplot. The whole uh, producer wants her to be a solo artist for no reason whatsoever. Like, she's going to no. make a million, jillion, bazillion dollars with Jim and the band. She doesn't need to be a solo artist. Like, you're going to make a shit ton of money with the band. Yeah, there was literally no motivation for Yeah, There's no motivation yeah. for it. It's... Like, why do this? Because I'm evil and I want to separate you from your family. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they, there was the love plot with Rio. It was like the chemistry between them was static. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, don't forget about the plot to the house that never got resolved. Yeah, that's right. Did they ever save the fucking house? No. She signed the contract and then that was the last we heard of it. This whole thing was started because they were going to get evicted from their house. Right. And then like the, the other sub, like, well, the, 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 the will, the dad's will was a subplot that was introduced in the 11th hour of the film. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Like all of these subplots just keep, get, keep getting introduced. You're like, just focus on one fucking thing or two things. Like stop introducing all the other subplots. Like, you know, go back to the last movie we watched transformers. Mm -hmm. um, okay so like yeah we agreed that that movie had some flaws and whatnot and it wasn't perfect or anything but it was still fun Mm -hmm. and one of the things that was fun is that transformers focused on one main plot and only like there's only like two subplots in the whole film Mm -hmm. so there's the the main plot was the autobots and the decepticons racing to find the all spark Mm -hmm. and the other subplot was basically uh sam kind of growing up Mm -hmm. you know uh then the the sector seven stuff but all of those subplots get resolved by the end of the film because there's only like two or there's only like two or three threads you gotta deal with. Whereas this movie, you know, you don't you've only got five million dollars to play with. You don't have the budget to have all these different subplots. You're just not Yeah. I mean that CG synergy toy thingy and such. How many millions of dollars did that cost? If you're not gonna have a synergy doing holograms on the girls, why have it at all? Yeah. Right, because synergy is in the in the TV show, so we gotta have it in some capacity. But like you only got five million dollars to play around with you don't have a whole lot of wiggle room to be introducing all these different subplots plus you only have a two-hour runtime yeah and you can't just hang subplots on movies to be resolved in sequels because then you have a movie like this where it's never going to get a sequel no so none of that shit's ever going to get resolved i don't know that's just part of the things i didn't like about this movie was just all the subplots keep getting introduced and like none of them have a satisfying conclusion or they just get dropped entirely. They just they don't even mention them, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't play into one another. They don't help one another. The fetch quest for the dad's shit that he left around the town that he somehow knew he was going to get to because as we established in the watch, the dad was a secret time traveler. Right, because th- there's one thing about movies that always drives me nuts, and that is the lack of believability. Believability is different than realism. Mm-hmm. And I, I understand that giant cars and trucks do not transform into giant robots but i believe that it happens in the transformers movies because it's believability yeah you know just like i i know there's no such thing as world war ii super soldiers but it's believable in the marvel universe yeah you know it follows its own rules it Mm -hmm. follows the rules of that universe just like any other major ip you know jedi in star wars and warp drive in star trek all of that stuff makes sense in their universe Mm -hmm. tango and cash's boot gun yes yeah yeah, boot, boot, gun boot gun. Yeah, boot gun makes sense. But this movie lacked any believability 
because one, she's a viral star on 30,000 YouTube views, which even in 2015, literally, you know, they say overnight sensation, the pacing of the film, it literally came out. Like it was the next day she had a record deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then like, so yeah, she's, she's a YouTube star on 30,000 views. That makes no sense. The robot makes no sense because the technology You could stretch that the technology could work in 2015, but there's no way it worked in 2000 or 1998 or 99 or whenever it was implied the dad built that stupid thing. Mm -hmm. Well, no, actually, it would be even earlier than that because she's like 17 or 18 years old. And assuming the movie takes place in 2015, she's 17 or 18 years old. The dad built that robot in 1995. There's no way. Mm Mm-hmm. So Jim's dad made this in a cave with a box of scraps. scraps. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I don't know. Like I said, it's just the movie lacked any form of believability. So therefore it just slogs. Yeah. 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 Uh, have you guys ever seen the movie, the rocker with rain Wilson? I have. Yeah. I have not. Okay. It's not the greatest movie, but it was a fun movie. Like the band became popular because they went viral on YouTube. Sound familiar? Yes. <laughs> the way that movie did it was so much better because it wasn't like, we're going to make one video and it's going to get super popular. Mm-hmm. There was believability, like you said. We're gonna That's going to be the word of the night, believability. Thank you, Dan. I do what I can. The believability of that was genuine in The Rocker. It was not in this movie because we kept joking. It's like, oh, guys, they're going to do a concert and sign a record deal on 30,000 views. Yeah, and then again, the timeline, that also sucks the believability out of the movie because the timeline makes no sense. Is this whole event, is this taking place over a week, a month, a year? Like, I don't know what the timeline is supposed to be for this. It's the same day. It all happened in the same day. The same day. Yeah, honestly, the most plot that made sense was our own plot. When we said the most of the movie was just a hypothermic, hallucinogenic fever dream that the girls and the guy were all suffering from after they jumped into the pier and were then sitting on a beach in soaking wet clothes in the middle of the night, suffering from hypothermia. Yeah. The reason why it makes no sense is because it's a hallucinogenic moment. Yes. The post credit scene is them still floating face down in the yeah. water. The bubbles yeah. have long stopped. <laughs> yeah. It's just police collecting bodies out of the ocean at this point. Yes. You know, so. Oh, that's what this movie feels like. Just collecting bodies. <laughs> it's a fever dream. They're like in a coma. Like they're singing on the beach, but they're all like wailing and speaking in tongue. Yeah. We're also like, it, it kind of felt like this. I don't know how true it is. Maybe Tom knows because of the production. But this movie definitely felt like it had like 15, 16, 20 different people writing the script. That's why all these subplots keep getting introduced because, you know, someone else touches touches it and adds their own flair to it. So No, no, thankfully, or not thankfully, considering the results, it only had the one guy that wrote it, Ryan Landles. He worked with John Chu on the TV show Legion of Extraordinary Dancers. So... I've seen little bits of that show. It's that's a show where the plot is just an excuse to have people do wild dancing and other nonsense. But at least that one had some kind of campy fun and respected the rules of its universe. I, yeah. I imagine that during this one's like, we only have this much budget. We, we can't get this location. We have to include synergy because we hopefully will turn this into a toy and make some money off of this. Ryan was probably just in there. It's just like, I've missed my wife and kids. <laughs> Let me go home. Why am I rewriting this again? Because we spent 10% of the budget on the chains holding you to the desk. I want to go home. Oh, who was it that this was their passion project again? That they I think it was the director, John M. Chu. He had been a passion project of his for ten years. Yeah, spent ten years of their life begging to have this movie made. What did it cost you, John? What did it cost you? Yeah, it's just awful. This is an awful film all around. Ironically enough, do you know what other movie that this guy directed? Hmm. G.I. Joe Retaliation. Yes, he did. Yes, well, he, he also, they, but in his defense, he also had a bigger budget. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And it felt like the writers of that film actually respected the source material. Yeah. You know, like G.I. Joe Retaliation is not a good film. I'm not going to say it's a great movie, but it did feel it was fun. It was fun because it feels like G.I. Joe. Like, as someone who grew up watching G.I. Joe, it felt like G.I. Joe. This movie did not feel like Gem and the Holograms, you know? No, so, no. Especially since I watched a couple of those episodes Tom shared before we, we recorded today. 
Like I watched a couple of those episodes and then when watching this movie, it bears no resemblance. No, except, no. except in the dude, names. honestly, it would have been funner if it's like, dude, anything would have been better than this film. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know an armchair direct or write, but dude, this movie was just, I understand the, why they went with the plot they did mm-hmm. because it was cheap, <laughs> but then the whole movie felt cheap. Yeah. Because they, they couldn't do, like, holographic costumes or anything like that. Because they could barely afford the holograms until, like, 90% of the way into the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then at the very end of the movie, the fucking uh, Synergy robot is projecting holograms right, right above his head. But, like, he's so small, and the, the holograms are so dinky looking that, like, only the people in the first two rows can see him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, it makes no sense. The Hannah Montana movie came out, I think, in 2009, 2010. It's a better gem in the holograms movie than this. <laughs> That's sad. That's sad. Oh, you were right at the beginning, Josh. This film needs to be redone. It needs another chance. Yeah. Legitimately, I think the IP is there. It just needs it needs a bigger budget and it needs a passionate writer and director. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I think the director wasn't bad, given his other projects. Because he did direct Now You See Me 2, Crazy Rich Asians, as we already said, G.I. Joe Retaliation. I didn't have any issues with directing on those films. Mm-hmm. I just think he needed some kind of a budget. Like you, I, I felt like watching this entire movie, you're seeing, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Consolations, like... Oh, shit. Compromises, yeah, compromises. all over this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, I see the, every single compromise he made. I give you guys shit about Nithix because it's like you see the movie that it could have been. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not forgiving this movie for Jack shit. <laughs> because this movie was terrible. There's no movie on the cutting room floor for this one. <laughs> but fuck, it's been eight years since this movie came out. Dude, nobody remembers this one. Yeah. No. Nobody remembers it. Fucking reboot it. Mm-hmm. You make it a March release. I don't fucking care. But give it more than a $5 million budget. Yeah. Look what they did with Barbie. It's a silly product about a toy that you can dress up. And they gave it the proper budget. They gave it the people that cared enough about to make it great. And yeah, look at that. Look at what what you can do. Yeah, like I said, Act 1. Actually, no, Act 1, let's do it the intro to The Rocker. Act 2, Rockstar. And then, like, you've got to have some conflict in there. You've got to have some emotional investment. Don't fucking, like, break up the band and then have that entire conflict resolved three minutes later with nothing to do to fix it. Yeah, just have it like it used to be in the cartoon. Jerrica was, you know, her dad owned the company. He died. He left in the will that she would be half owner. You had this whole fetch quest thing. You got this whole will thing. The, the, the who owns the company. Just do that. Just do something like that. You have, you, you bring in the misfits because the misfits were the antagonists. There was someone you can look to and say, I want to see them lose. Yes. Dude, you don't even need the misfits to be the main antagonist. Just show like cuts to like TVs of them giving interviews talking about how crappy Jim and the holograms are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like no direct confrontation. You don't even need it. I mean, you can make them the antagonists of the movie. Mm-hmm. But it's like this movie, Erica was supposed to be the main antagonist. That really wasn't revealed until like, or it's like they forgot Mm -hmm. until like 95% of the way through the movie. And they're like, oh, fuck, we got to make her evil. She's supposed to be the bad guy. Yeah, she's supposed to be evil. Yeah. But there was nothing really leading up to that. The worst thing she did was say, I want you to be a solo artist. Why? Yeah, why? Just (laughs) because it's going to make me seem bad. Why? That's just such a dumb subplot. It it's is. Like, it makes no sense because the whole thing is like, I want to rebuild my record label and be rich and famous again as a more as a really powerful record mogul in LA. And you're like, okay, well then now you've got this viral sensation mm-hmm. girl band that everyone seems to love. I think you're going to make a lot of money with them. I want her to be a solo artist. Well, you're going to make a lot of money. You're not evil. You're stupid. <laughs> I mean, fuck, they had Molly Ringwald. Molly Ringwald was wasted. No, it's the film that this movie was recorded on was wasted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The precious studio time they used to record this film was wasted. The union guys who had to rebuild the sets and put things together and rig the lightings and do all that, they were wasted. Two hours of our lives gone. Yeah, hours. So I think it's pretty clear that this is... um. We're not fans of this movie, but in the pantheon of shitty movies that we have watched on this Oh, are podcast, we doing the rankings now? Yeah. Yes. Where does this stand on the <sighs> rankings, fellas? This is... Uh, oh, fuck. Is this worse than Pathfinder? That's a... Okay, so worst movie, starting from the worst. 
True Grit, then Jim and the Holograms. That was for you, Dan. <laughs> that is just low. <laughs> Like, I get you don't like True Grit, but that is not worse than this film. <laughs> There's no way. There's no way. I, I respect the fact that you don't like True Grit, but it is not worse. No, than no, this. no. Like all honesty, out of our worst movies. Uh, okay, this or Art of War? Ooh, oh, that's a hard one. Oh. Art of War at least had some decent fight scenes in it. So I'm, I'm going to go with this one. Okay, so this is worse than Art of War. Yeah. Uh, Swashbuckler. <sighs> See, that's where I'm struggling. Because Swashbuckler was bafflingly bad. But at least, yeah. at least it had the hookspa to baffle. Yeah. This just was... Plus, Ugh. Pathfinder, Path or not Pathfinder, uh, Swashbuckler was a bad film, but we got to see a naked Genevieve Bajold in the movie, so I'm still going to go with. But this we didn't one. see nipple. Yeah, but it, yeah, but I got to see butt and you know, yeah, whatever. that's it's true. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with this one. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm still working Swashbuckler. I would say Dead Calm was better. Oh no, um, I'm disagreeing on that one. You no, think that I'm gonna, this is yeah, better no, than Dead Calm? Yeah. Nah, Dead Calm's better. Flying baby out of the windshield, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> no, Dead Calm was better. Yeah, no, Dead Calm's better than this film because Dead yeah. Baby flying out of the windshield. That was just unintentional comedy. Trump's intentional, not comedy. And then, like, Killing the Dog, Killing Billy Zane. It had a couple of cool scenes. This movie had, like, nothing. Yes, right. Yeah, the cool, like, the, the, the Billy Zane dying with the from the flare gun into the mouth was kind of awesome. So it's like, okay. I think the best way to describe this movie is, you know how some people will describe food as styrofoam? Yes. Like, they're eating legitimate food. Like, dude, this tastes like styrofoam. This movie is actually eating styrofoam. <laughs> Glittery styrofoam, but styrofoam. Maybe. Yeah. Now, I'd have to say this is probably one of the worst I've ever seen. Yeah. If that, for me, it's either this or Pathfinder. Yeah, I'd say this is better than Dead Calm because, yeah, Dead Calm had an interesting opening and a very good way to end the film. But in between, just uh, it just did just sat there. Whereas, of movies that I would I would watch again before watching this one again, mm -hmm. I probably would watch Swashbuckler again. I definitely would watch Dead Calm before this one. I don't know. I think I might actually watch Pathfinder before this one. Jesus. I definitely would watch Doom. Oh, yeah, definitely, um, yes. Yeah, but like, even though I didn't like Doom, Doom is still like more fun than this movie. Doom, yeah, that's the thing. Doom is fun. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is, movie is just annoying. Mm hmm. Oh, um, um, ooh, Nighthawks. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's oh, Nighthawks, Nighthawks did have that nice, that cool uh, subway chase and the car chase and all that. Um, yeah, I, I like I like Nighthawks better than this. That's for sure. I'd agree. Yeah, there was there was more yeah. thing. It was like, simpler it, too. Also, like Nighthawks did have Billy D. Williams, and he does make things better by default by being Billy D. Williams. Fuck, I do not so, know. That's a tough yeah. one for me. I mean, this Slipstream is better than this film. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Slip, slipstream. I'd watch Slipstream again before this. Yeah, film. yeah. Okay, I actually found a movie. I don't. I like this movie better than. Of the movies we've done. What? This movie, as bad as it was, and as much as it offended me, I liked it more than Wimbledon. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I hated Wimbledon. That movie was awful. That movie was terrible. Yeah. Mom, Dad, I love you guys. <laughs> but I agree. They love that movie. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I no. mean, Wimbledon might have gotten John Favreau and What's-His-Name together so he could be Vision in, you know, Iron Man and the other stuff. But no, no, that movie was not worth it Ooh, the greatest oh shit oh yeah also uh i have to say uh i enjoyed this film more than the shootest i did yep. not like yes. the shootest the greatest um, i think i like this better than the greatest. yeah 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 so yeah. it's not the worst we've seen yeah. but it's definitely top five mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Looking, at, looking at our last few movies going even going back two years ago with our last big journey this is the worst we've seen in a while. Like yeah. we didn't even hate like the flash this much or anything, you know? So, no, so. no, I would watch the flash. Again. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's it for tonight's show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And now we're just going down the list of yeah, movies. That, we are. Yeah. We're but uh, this, it may not be the worst of the worst we've seen, but it's definitely in the top five of the worst. It is definitely the lowest rated IMDb. If, yeah. If I can find otherwise, I'll correct in another episode. But 
I don't care about this movie that much. No, no. No one cared about this movie that much. With the exception of the guy who was trying to make it. That poor bastard. I hope it was worth it, dude. It wasn't. It wasn't. That's why you haven't heard from him since. It's just killed his enthusiasm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's it for tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us at firepitpodcast.com. You can get uh, links to Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever you listen to your podcasts at, as long as you're listening to us. Hopefully these episodes will be coming out the last Saturday of the month, January through uh, May 2024. So like and subscribe. We enjoy making these films and we're hoping to maintain a monthly release schedule with at least 12 episodes a year, but life does get in the way occasionally. So if we can't keep to that, you're apologizing in advance, but get out there and review, get us out there because the more views and stuff we get, it's definitely motivating. We would like to get paid for this at some point. It would be nice. Oh, that would be, that's the dream. Mm -hmm. That is the dream. One day we'll have a viral podcast of 30,000 listens and we'll get that dream of finally being professional podcasters. Oh, Don, Dan, I think we have a st- plot for the skit for this episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and be sure to join our Discord channel as well, as well as our other social medias. We are also on Facebook and X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, as well. Links are in the episode's description at uh, firepitpodcast.com, discord.me slash firepit. You'll get notifications of new episodes. Even better, you can engage some of us with discussions of the show or other fans of discussion of the show. But uh, if anything, just follow us on uh, firepitpodcast.com and uh, you'll always get notifications of uh, episodes. And in the meantime, you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com and also like our page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter slash X at firepitcce. Both are linked in this episode's description as well. Um, I don't have too many shout outs, but I would like to shout out the Cleveland Browns, who, as of this recording, are no longer in (laughs) playoff contention, but at least they ended on a winning season, which is more than we can say about this movie. So shout out to Cleveland, your broken clocks. You get it right every so often. So thank you for that. And I will shout out Addie's Diner here in Oregon. I got the pancake for breakfast a few days ago and they serve it on a turkey platter. It's the size of a turkey platter. I'm still eating off that pancake. So <laughs> uh, yeah, shout out to Abby's diner for using a week's worth of pancake batter for one single solitary pancake. The true hero of the story. Any shout? Anyone for you? Anyone um, for you? I, I, I will shout out. Josh has broken. <laughs> Shout out the trauma center that Josh is going to go to. Yeah, after this. my brain just stops functioning. Uh, like, well, let's get, let's get Josh to bed and move to the outro then. Yeah. <laughs> now, shout out to my parents. Like I've been down here in Texas since the end of November, and I've been able to hang out with them more times in the past like couple of months than I have in years. So it's been awesome being able to see them again more than once a year. Mm-hmm. I love you guys. Thank you again for letting me, you know, crash at your place frequently as I have been. That's the one thing I'm uh, I'm going to be sad about about leaving Texas. Now, by the time this comes out, I've been gone for longer than I was here cuz we're recording this middle January. Mhm. Yes. Like probably days before we release the selection section. But still, I'm still in Texas as the time of this recording. So just love you guys. Thank you, Caleb, my brother. Love you too. And I can't wait to see my family next week because I'm finally out of here on Wednesday. So shout out to my wife and my kids. Woohoo. So what movie are we watching next month? Even though it's probably gonna be next week in real time. Well, I think um I think we're going to uh, have the power? Hopefully. Yes, we are, but it's a certain power. It's the power of friendship? Uh, more like the power of Grayskull. Wait, wait, I thought it was beside the power of Grayskull. By the power. We will be revealed fabulous powers of infinite strength. Can I wear a thong? No. no. I'm drawing the line on that one. So I don't have that power. No. Can I wear a fuzzy like over? Josh. Moving on. <laughs> Josh, you know what? It's after this movie. You know what I say? You can be the master of your own universe. Go for it. I have 
the power. <laughs> Please join us next month as we conclude this journey of the Masters of the Universe Super Saturday Super Power Hour as we watch Masters of the Universe, the uh, 1987 version. Uh, actually, well, it's the only live action version currently starring Dolph Lundgren and Frank Langella. And Courtney Cox. And Courtney Cox and Tom Paris or uh, uh, Robert Duncan McNeil is his name. But uh, yeah, so it should be fun. Uh, it's going to be a good time. May not be a great movie, but we're going to have a lot of fun watching it. And we're going to, I guarantee we're going to have more fun watching that than we had this one tonight. So, but until yeah. then, I've been Josh. I've been Dan. And I've been Tom. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. And now, a rather important update on the Constable Guillotine scandal. In response to this outcry from parental groups, effective immediately, all production of Constable Guillotine toys will be halted, and toy stores are expected to recall any and all Constable Guillotine merchandise. We now go live to Joan back at St. Jesus Memorial Hospital for a reaction to this news. Joan? Well, it's complete anarchy, rather. Armies of maimed grade schoolers have overwhelmed the staff and taken over the hospital. They refuse to release any hostages until the recall of Constable Guillotine toys are lifted. The FBI tried to placate them with talking chud figures, but they just stuffed them with the heads of the agents and threw them back. I'm currently hiding under what's left of Dr. Bushi, and it's only a matter of time before they find me. Um, if you see my family, please tell them I love them. Hey! That's the chick that's trying to get rid of Constable Guillotine! Get her! Wait, no, I'm not the one who's calling the number. Joan? Joan, can you hear me? Joan? <clears throat> We now go to Stevie Smalls for his latest report on water skiing squirrels. Take it away, Stevie. Turns out squirrels can't really swim that well. There's a lot, there's a lot of them here. It's so, there's so many corpses. So is the guillotine a sword or is the sword a guillotine? Yes, Joan. Is she still going on about that sword? I am Stevie Dreamy Smalls. I'm still here. <laughs> well, at least he's not Ricky Sticky Smalls or whatever the fuck that kid's name was. That's not his name, Joan. Are you just being spiteful? I don't like you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Cut print. <laughs>